the much awaited uh, reveal of the Q&A winner questions. So Donald, are you ready for the questions that have been submitted by the students for you? Okay. Okay, so we're going to welcome on stage this really cute boy we met earlier in the day, Deva Gidikshit, who will be voicing questions submitted by all of you guys for us. So Devya, can we have you on stage to present Donald the questions that you guys want to ask him? There he is. Are you going to play a little drumming tune for Devagya? For, for, for. All right. Uh oh. Come on. Maybe he's going to play the drums in space. So he, yes, he is one of he's one of those drum prodigies who can make what five thousand beats in three minutes. Is that right, Devagya? Five thousand seventy. So, apologies. Wow. Right. Okay, come on. Are you going to play before you ask him the questions? Yes. All right, go for it. I want to see you playing in space. I want to see you do that in space. You think you can play the drums in space? Yes, sir. Yes, you can. Will it make sound if you're outside of the spacecraft? Will you, can you make the sound in space outside of the spacecraft? That's a trick question. No. They, they you, we'll have aliens lining up to listen to your music, and then we will discover if there's life on Mars. That's right. That's Isn't right. It? The Martians are going to come out and dance for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Come on, Vagina. We want you to ask those five questions that uh, have to be asked to Donald. Come on. So the first question that I want to ask uh, you is, we know that there are ice caps on the poles of Mars, but can we reduce the water becoming into water vapor because Well, it, that's a great question. In fact, the idea of water on Mars is very important because we can use water to make uh, not only water for the astronauts, but we can turn it into oxygen. We're trying to figure out how to convert oxygen. But the interesting thing is, the hottest it actually ever gets on Mars at the equator is like uh, 20 degrees Celsius, right? But then it gets very, very, very cold, like, you know, minus 100 degrees Celsius, I think. So it's, it's probably not going to uh, immediately evaporate, uh, but I'm not a physicist and I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to misspeak. But what we are looking at is how to have special containers to contain the water once we convert it, because you want to be able to save it. Okay, great question. You obviously are very smart. The second question that I want to ask from, uh, for you is, initially Earth did not have life because of various reasons, such as temperature variation, lack of resources of survival, lack of water, understood the question. I'm not sure I quite got it. Uh, it's still early in the morning for me. Uh, Devani, so apologies, but it, it was about the question of life in the universe, right? And so I think the biggest question that you ought to, and all of your students, scientists who are participating, ought to ask is, 
what do we mean by life? This is something that NASA scientists are actually struggling with a little bit. I mean, is it life like human being life? Is it just an organic cell? Is it a virus? What is it going to look like? Does it have to be able to reproduce itself? Is that what we mean by life? And so we are trying to find it. In fact, many of our big telescopes are looking for atmospheres around other planets. We're actually found other planets. You know, when I was your age, we didn't know there were other planets in the universe. We only thought we knew we knew for sure there was Earth. But now we know there's thousands and thousands of other planets that are similar to Earth. And the question is, is there an atmosphere around that? And is there water? Because we think you have to have an atmosphere and water in order to have life. And so this is what's very interesting about our research is to figure that out. And I fully expect you and several of your other colleagues on this program one day are going to find out whether or not enough life exists on another planet. And that's really a question that we need to ask ourselves is do we think that's possible and what is it going to look like? So get busy. Yeah. All right. That's a... The third question that I want to ask is, what is the use of solid fuel and how it works in rockets that also contains liquid fuel? Right. So, you know, there's two types of uh, propulsion fuels for rockets. There's liquid propulsion and then there's solid propulsion. Liquid just simply means that you have... Uh, an oxidizer, something that helps ignite the fuel, so you have to mix it up into the combustion chamber, and you can control the thrust because you can control how much the oxidizer actually gets into the combustion chamber. A solid fuel, you mix the oxidizer with the, the propellant beforehand. It's actually, it actually is solid. If you actually look at it, it looks like uh, the tip of an eraser, like a rubber. The problem is that once you like a solid rocket, you can't uh, you can't change it. it. Once you light it, it's gone. It, it you you can't turn it down. You can't say, "Oops, I didn't mean to go that fast." It's like you take your foot on the accelerator and you push it down, and you can never lift it up. You're like, "Oh my God!" So you better be going in the right direction when you do it. So there's there's pros and cons to both. In fact, when we flew the space shuttle, we had both. We have the solid rocket boosters which were on the outside they were solid motors and on the shuttle itself we had three liquid propulsion uh, uh, rocket engines that we can change the thrust as necessary great question wow Devak is on a roll question four yes the question four what is the relation between time and space time and space wow uh so have you been talking to albert einstein because you know you need to know who albert einstein was because there's a relationship between time and space that he spent a lot of time on now i'm not an astrophysicist but i know that space we think about space in three dimensions right you know there's up and down and then there's distance and things like that that's how we find things in space right we do coordinates in space whereas time is a unit uh, over time that passes but it turns out that einstein figured out that there really was a relationship between time and space and that's pretty much all i know young man so clearly you know a lot more about this than i do i think you need to come work for nasa <laughs> Yes, so I definitely be there, but I want to be an astronaut. Okay. Oh, my God. Okay. Cute ocean just an overdrive. Question five. That's the last question that I want to ask from you is: Can uh, the, we have seen that Hubble Space Telescope has clicked many pictures of gal galaxies, dwarf planets? star systems, and many other planets. And it has even proved that our universe is expanding. This is the best time to visit Mars. Otherwise, it will be a tough job for us guys. Because it is getting further, 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 day by day. <laughs> but my question is, can the new telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope Click the picture of the surface of Proxima Centauri A, B, and see if there any life on that planet. 
done it because I really want to meet aliens. If there would be no life, I just left. Well, great question. Let me just say in short, the Hubble telescope is a telescope that we've had for about 25 years. It can see really far into the distance, right? We're trying to understand, you know, at the edge of the universe, because NASA is very interested in how did the universe form? Is it the Big Bang Theory? And is the universe still expanding? The problem with Hubble is that when you want to see past a lot of galaxies and a lot of uh, a cosmic dust, it's hard for Hubble to see through all of that. So the James Webb Telescope has what's called an infrared instrument, when infrared is a different part of the light spectrum, right? So Hubble really is more in the optics and the ultraviolet, but James Webb is in the infrared. And infrared is like x-rays. It can like see right through you and say, What's going on inside your body right now? Whereas Hubble can see that you have a bow tie and a nice shirt and you've got nice glasses. But James Webb is so powerful, it can see inside your brain. And so it can see really, really far out in the universe. And so we it's a successor to Hubble to try to learn more about what's on the side of the universe that we actually can't see. Fantastic question. One day you can be an astronomer and have time on James Webb Telescope and see if there's drummers drumming on a galaxy that we can't see right now. And I want you to tell me about it. <laughs> that has to be a promise. Thank yes. you so very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great question. I'm sure I wanted to tell you something. Well, it's up to Minnie. She's in charge. You okay. got to ask. Her right. Yes, of course. What, what, what do you have to tell Donald? You're very great, and the questions that you just answered, they were completely like a very simple concept, and I understood. Oh, he just paid you a sweet little compliment, Donald. Oh, thank you. We're gonna be friends. We're gonna be friends. <laughs> You teach me how to drum, I'll teach you how to have good manners, all right? Although I don't have to teach you very much, you already have great manners. You're the kind of person that we want at NASA. So come on over here. We'll find something for you, all right, pal? After COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I told you it's all about manners. Well done, Devag. You made us very, very proud. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Thank you, Devag. I'm proud of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. We have Donald for a little while longer with us. And now our next segment that we've got to do with you, Donald, is called Young Visionaries. Um, so as we all know, young minds.